Thank you. Thank you for the intro. So welcome everybody. We do have a great group of panelists here today uh, to talk about the tomorrow's media landscape. So I guess we're, we're going to start with Joe. We're going to work our way down. But uh, starting from the top, what does tomorrow's successful media company look like? Uh, to me, I think it's someone who's in a company that is able to play on multiple spectrums. Uh, I think we're blessed at ABC News and ABC to be able to play across television, radio, uh, digital spectrums, mobile, all of that together. And I think it's going to take a very flexible workforce and people who are able to play in all of those spaces. Um, I think what we're trying to do is be able to play in all those spaces. It's not just television online anymore or any of these other things. So I think uh, you'll see us creating a lot of different unique experiences uh, to hit each of those. Kevin? Um, I mean, I think one of the key components of uh, any media company that's uh, developing in the future will have to be to consider all the different ways that content um, will be expressed. So everything from something as long as a tweet can be as important for your business as something that is high production value combination of video, audio, text. So I think we'll see a lot more evolution of, of what digi digital storytelling means um, and will be more mixed media um, and won't be so bifurcated uh, between putting some television online, putting some audio online, putting text up, um, and I think we'll see a lot of that, um, those components start to converge a bit. Um, I, I would say it's about productizing the content. And you, know, you guys have said it, it's, it's not one, it's not linear television that goes then into ancillary products, it's what's the full experience. And I think one of the problems that we have now and where we have to migrate to is we start with legacy content. You're a website, you're a linear television program. You try and figure out how to address a full audience spectrum across social, mobile, uh, web, television, and it's just the wrong way to go about it. So I think what we'll see is as these legacy architectures go away, we're going to be able to start fresh and look at a 360 degree uh, product out of content, not simply the, the content itself. I think it's going to be all about quality at scale. That's something that we really focus on at Vox Media with our brands SB Nation, The Verge, and Polygon. The idea is really about quality media and brought to you on every device you know, through responsive design, etc. Uh, and this idea of the experience is something that is fully integrated, whether it's your advertising technology or your storytelling and editorial journalism. I think the future media company is, as what's been said here, it's more like a technology company in that you have your bread and butter and that's quality journalism and as Kelly said, at scale. But you also have to be set up to be able to develop new products for new platforms quickly. So at Mashable, we just rolled out an app for Google Glass. We don't know. You don't know if Google Glass is the future, but you need to have an app there and it needs to have a consistent feel and it needs to have quality content, needs to represent your brand. So I think future media companies need to be more like technology companies. They need to dog food. They need to iterate quickly and try new platforms than just focus on media. Yeah, they have to get that really, really good, but it's going to be everything and companies need to be set up to do so. I guess to that point, though, I mean, if you look at you guys all kind of hit on it as a theme. But in terms of experimentation, I mean, if you look at the landscape right now, you have everything from six second vines on one side to great long form stuff on one side. There's a lot of playing. Like what's, what's the, what things do you see right now that are being, what, what's here, what's here today, what's gonna be here tomorrow? Like what's, has a track? At Vox, we're seeing tremendous yeah. uh, engagement with our long-form pieces. You know, these are pieces that uh, take months to build in some cases, from everything from design and development to the reporting of them. We're seeing, on average, 17 minutes engagement with each piece. That's time on site. You know, and you think about how much uh, distraction there is in this world, and to have readers spending 17 minutes with one piece, you know, watching a video, reading a story, something, that's really incredible. And I think that we'll see a return to that if, if people are putting out quality content. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of engagement around visuals at Mashable, and I think you know, with the rise of Pinterest and the acquisition of Instagram and the prominence Facebook's putting on that, um, I wouldn't say it's anything new. I think it's a return to a Mad Men era where great copy and great visuals can really tell a story. Yes, you have to back it up with the quality of reporting behind it, but you know, we're going to see greater visuals. I think having visual designers are going to be an important part of a newsroom, so that's certainly a trend that we're seeing. 
I love, I lo I'm sorry, I, I no, love what you just said. Uh, it's, it's nothing new. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything that's new. I think it's the, the, the delivery and the form factor that becomes new. And that experimentation is what's killing us because there's so many new form factors. Mm -hmm. But I don't know anybody who can't dive, who, who, who can avoid diving in to everything to experiment and see what works. Um, USA Today, Gannett's properties, everything is focused on video. We're seeing 200, 400% increases in mobile video across the board. Uh, programming that video becomes the focus, what works. I think you, you know, had mentioned six second cat videos. Everybody loves cat videos. Um, it's experimentation to see what ends up engaging the audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I think what we're trying to do, and just kind of going to the earlier question, I mean, as we go forward, and I think this is, is harder for some larger traditional media companies, this is only going to be about 50% editorial as we go forward. So we know we're great storytellers, we know we're the best in the business doing that, but the other 50% is going to be how people are actually interacting with it. So, you know, like we're saying, it, for us, we like to experiment. If we fail, we're going to fail quickly and get out of it. And our rule is, you know, as long as the news is right, we're going to try to do anything once. Uh, and our real focus, obviously, is video. We're a video company. And I think what's most exciting about our live experiences and some of that video is, you know, we're able to get television audiences. On election night, we had 10 million live streams. We're, we're able to duplicate what cable television is doing and even broadcast television in some cases. Um, but we're also trying to see how you interact with that. So we just launched something called the Social Sound Tracker, which is a, a very small product. But it's a, the ability for people to actually you know, sign on through Facebook, watch what we're doing, and be able to interact with each other. And so those are the things that we find the most interesting as we go forward. But we're still going to do what we all do best, which is you know, really the content at the beginning of the but day. But in terms of experimenting and then cutting losses, I mean, can, an election's a tough one because it comes around every four years and it's such a mass. The minute the you're, election you're getting, is over, you, we stop. Exactly. You're going to get yeah. quality and scale with that. Yes. How do you gauge smaller releases that don't have, you know, the kind of the underpinning of an election cycle? You know, I think you have to try on a daily basis. I mean, Microsoft, a lot of people are coming out with different apps and things. Some of those will require more investment than others, but you've got to try. I think there's a lot of topics we're not always sure about. We're, we're doing a lot of graduation speeches and trying out with that, but we'll also go to, you know, fashion and some entertainment and some lifestyle types of things mm -hmm. just to try to give our audience um, different things. And, you know, at ABC News, we're blessed. We actually cover all of these things, but we also take things like GMA. We actually do a live version of GMA every morning that's just digital. So you can experiment in a lot of different ways, and we're lucky we have a lot to play with in our sandbox. I mean, I think one thing that we, we sort of need to be a little bit honest about when it comes to a lot of digital content is um, the, the production value of what's being put up there right now. I mean, some of the better organizations are good at experimenting, but when most, when your average Tumblr blog is actually better designed than like a major <laughs> news site, like you know we're still at the beginning of this and like it's really just beginning. And you see great things like what Mashable and Vox like are doing with um, some longer form pieces. I think that's just the beginning of doing more true digital storytelling, but I do think that there's um, something to the idea of programming, especially when you think of the larger news organizations and how they can bring that expertise to online. Like, online hasn't really been programmed that well in the way that we think about, um, you know, when we think about uh, what, what time things go live, what time that they're on, um, day parting even. Like, we're really not even scratching the surface in this way. And I think leveraging the skills of the organizations that are very good at doing that in other spaces beyond bringing the content um, to digital, um, those, that expertise can be really valuable, especially in um, and it's just not really even being, being done. And most media companies seem to kind of like just put content up and hope that it works out. And that's why they're scratching their heads going like, well, I don't know if this is monetizable because it doesn't even seem like a lot of them are trying. I think, I think where this is going to become really important is as smart TV becomes a ubiquitous platform and we are all driven to create that app that sits on top of the Samsung, sits on top of the Sharp and compete against linear programming it's no longer going to be acceptable to have sort of a half-baked video product that dabbles in a content vertical with low production value. I mean, yes, you will always get those gems that come out, but I think we're all going to be challenged with that cost. And that's where the advertising is going to come in, because it's not going to be financeable and not going to have a, a respectable ROI if we can't get it sponsored. 
Go ahead. Stacey really touched on this earlier, but at Vox, something that we really pride ourselves on is being a media and technology company. And I think that's something that every future media company is going to have to be, something that integrates media, uh, media and technology. And we like to call it radical collaboration between advertising, editorial, and technology. And that means that all three sides of the company work together to build the best experiences in advertising or in storytelling. And that's because, exactly, you can't have these siloed different sections where uh, editorial is up on floor eight and can't be anywhere near advertising on floor two. I think that we're going to see a lot more integration of these different sections. It's tough. And I think it's to the tough. point of like experimentation earlier, you know, it's it's nice to think about like, oh, okay, let's let's um, create a new app for this new environment. When you look at like most of the major news apps, like some of our are even using like third parties to basically power and handle their entire mobile experience, which is just hilarious to me because I mean, the it was mentioned before, like the the products that express this content have to work just as well as any other app in somebody's life. Um, they're not really distinguishing so much between content and application and service. Like it's blending a lot more that the quality of that um, that experience really has to come through. It can't just be, well, we found this third party provider and we give them a JSON feed and it comes up with a list of headlines and you can scroll through them. Yep, we're on mobile. So um, I think there has to be a lot more care and effort and thought put into time and place and, and the, 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 the moment of experience and the moment of consumption. So I think it's funny because um News orgs and media companies have always been financed by advertising, and, and traditionally there's been a big wall, but to all these points, I think that more and more media companies, their secret, their secret power is brand, because you have to be on all platforms. You have an app, you have a mobile site, you have Facebook, you have Pinterest, you have Vine, whatever's next. But your brand is what's really going to separate you so that when I'm in my feed and I see Mashable, I know what to expect. And when I see the USA Today, I know what to expect across platforms. And I think design plays a key role in that. That's why I do think it's problematic to have these outside developers creating what your brand looks like. But design will be a big differentiator for media companies now and going forward, especially as web evolves and we can have more sophisticated design. So I think we have to think a little more like marketers than we're used to and that we're comfortable with. I, I want to challenge you, though, just on one point. Please do. People constantly say design as if that means prettier, more aesthetically dense. And I, I, I think one of the ways you productize something is by looking at its utility. Mm -hmm. And utility should drive, in my opinion, utility should drive design. Because the context in which people use these products now varies from device to device to context to context. So I'm not saying you're wrong. I just, it, it's a, well, it goes I, on a slippery slope. I mean, slope. my definition, so at Mashable, we think of design as pretty plus usability equals UX. So right. you have to nail the UX. Otherwise, you just have a pretty site that sucks or a sucky site that's not pretty. And, and people have to have both. I totally agree. When I think when it comes to brand, one of the things that's a challenge, I think, for whether it's a storied brand with a long history of television or it's a new digital native brand like Mashable or Vox, um, the, you have to cede some control or admit that you're going to have to cede some control over the way your content's going to travel. And I think if there's one thing we're, we're all facing when we think about the future of media, it's that the content will travel in ways that, that media companies cannot control. And we're already seeing that. And so um, I think the components of what makes up a digital story are going to allow it to be broken apart, and they will be broken apart and disseminated um, through all the experiences that people are consuming content um, in a variety of forms. And so, thinking about how that content will travel and still uh, represent the brand in a positive way, um, I think is 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 important. And, and it's I think that's going to change the way that stories are structured in the future. I guess the question for the group would be: in a world where half the traffic is coming through Twitter, coming through Facebook, coming through Pinterest. And you know, readers, consumers are coming to a site and they're jumping right back out. Does a brand matter? I mean, they're 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 really just coming for they're coming for a snackable bit and they're and they're getting back on their way. A person that follows a brand on Twitter is part of the audience. It's not like they're not. Um, you know, I think there used to be this thought like it's our the people that come to our homepage or our aggregate uniques. But somebody who has it in their Twitter feed is is uh, uh, very much but, a, as much a part of the audience as someone. I else guess to make one distinction, I guess there's a difference between clicking on a brand's page, coming back to their story, versus coming back from someone else, a social influencer who drives that link back to a destination site. But I, I think that's our challenge. 
our job, in part, is to say what that brand represents. It's to secure that user once they do click through and say, here's the reason you should acquire us or download our app. Uh, conversion, we spend so much time looking at conversion at lifetime value, at attrition rates, at churn, to understand where we can hook someone and bring them back to the app to retain them, to get them, you know, if they're in for 30 days, I know their page view per or session or screen view goes up dramatically. That's our job. And but, brand does matter. But in an age with a lot of media, I mean, brands do matter. I mean, being in news in, in particular, you know, trust actually does matter. If you're, you're looking at a big story or something's happening in the world or there's, God forbid, a terrorist event or something like that, people really want to know that what they're getting is real. And like what we do see is, you know, you'll, you'll see something explode on Twitter. People are going to go back to a brand they trust to make sure that that's even real. I think we can all agree with what you're saying. You have to play on all of those different fields. It's very important for all of us to be there. You know, we're very blessed. We have a very strong brand. We also have a lot of strong brands within our brand. If Diane Sawyer is saying something or George Stephanopoulos is saying something, you know, we, those are all different programming angles that we're using, as well as our users, our affiliates. There's a lot of different things we can do. But at the end of the day, you know, people want to know and trust something. And I, and I do think brand will continue to go, but I do think it's our challenge to give the products, give the editorial on top of that to make your brand still relevant and trustworthy as you go forward. Well, I can share an example of that. I mean, Mashable, which started as um, a personal blog and now is you know, a global media company, primarily got most of its traffic early on from search. Um, and then as social grew, social became a big part. But now, while social is um, you know, first in terms of referrals, direct traffic is next. You know, it's Eclipse search. So people actually know Mashable and type in mashable.com every day and every hour. And so we've seen that our, that brand matters and brand grows. And I think that's a really healthy sign that, that that's happening. Well, I'd give it to Kelly, actually, because trust takes time. I mean, ABC News has been in the business for a long time. Vox less so. But I, I guess maybe speak to that a little bit. I think brand is more important than ever because in this day and age with so many digital media outlets, your readers are your best marketers. They are the people who are out there sharing your content. And what does it say about them when they share your content? I've always said, you are what you share. Uh, go down your Facebook feed. If you're sharing the New York Times, you look intelligent and you know, cultured. If you're sharing The Verge, you look well-informed and you know, in the know, something like that. You want to figure out what your brand stands for. And that's more important than ever with all of these digital news outlets competing for FaceTime from readers. But it's a challenge, I think, to maintain your brand in these different spaces because if you if you start seeding too much of that and you let other people kind of take that, you know, we might have a strong brand going in, but we are challenged every single day to continue to launch different things, build new brands, build new expertise, frankly, in this field to even maintain that. So I don't think just because you're coming in as an establishment, you're going to be able to hold that. And yeah. I think we saw so much of that issue of trust with the Boston bombing. You know, arguably the best coverage was from the New York Times and the Boston Globe. That's what everybody was saying. And those brands have stood for legacy, institutional, good quality media for a very long time. And while a lot of people have been saying things like Reddit, et cetera, are going to disrupt old media, we saw that people went back to the New York Times and to Boston Globe because they were getting consistent and reliably good coverage. And the challenge there as, as a media company is to capitalize on what you do well, and those spikes in traffic where people come to you because they trust you and convert that. That's what I keep going back to. Um, when I ran weather.com for a, a, a long time, and during those high weather spikes, you knew you were gonna get 50 million, 100 million video streams, and then once the severe weather was over, you were done. So your job, our job, was to keep that traffic up and consistent so that we we're at the mercy of a, of a large news event and losing people to smaller competitors. That said, um, the idea of trust, while we, we like to think that, well, in the end, people will go back to these brands that we trust, and that's what people say, and, and there were definitely there was definitely high traffic on major news sites during the bombings. Like, there were still millions and millions of people that were just using Twitter. Um, and CNN tried to play that game and failed. Um, is that going to hurt CNN's traffic in the long run? I don't know. People say these things matter, but they don't actually act on them. So I do think that there is something to be aware of with younger audiences that, that this may not necessarily always stay true. And that, that 
banking on trust with your brand might be a tough sell in the future. And I'm not saying this is a good thing, I'm just saying it may be true. Well, I mean, I think the people you trust the most are your friends and family, and I think that's where media is starting to go. So it is, brand does matter, that will be most shareable, you'll most talk about it. But in those situations, and Facebook, going back to your point, those are, the, those are my trusted people. Those are really my first line reporters and my friends and family. Uh, I mean, I think I would say tomorrow's landscape is going to be made up by companies that are you know, 50, 60, 70 years old. But they're also going to be made up of companies that have been launched in the, next, in the last five years. I guess to the, to the point of, I guess, today's news, keep this really current. I mean, Tumblr, Yahoo, big news. Both of those are media companies. Both of those probably define trust in different ways. Are we defining a media company very, very narrowly or just looking at how are people responding to large news events for the group? Yeah, I, I think the definition of a media company is going to come down to almost individuals as we go forward and how people are actually starting to use these tools, whether that tool be a product or that tool be an editorial, you know, like an ABC News story, I can actually put that into my feed. I think at the end of the day, we're all going to be in control of our own media destinies, and I think it's going to be up to us to keep giving the products and the fuel into those people to program for themselves. And I think the important thing is that for an end user, it's all media, whether it's a photo on Instagram, a Vine from your friend or somebody that you follow, or it's a major news story on a major news site. It's all content and it's all consumed through a series of lenses, and the lenses that matter to them are the, gonna be the ones that are the source, and may expose them to new brands that become other lenses that are part of their media diet. But I don't think there, are, there, are, there aren't these distinctions anymore between like news and social media. It's all just content. Um, and the content that enriches their life the most is what they're going to spend the most time with. And that's why I think this idea of distribution models and being everywhere is going to be so important. You want to be finding these readers wherever they are, whether that's Flipboard or Facebook or Instagram, et cetera. You want to be everywhere. And I think that that's going to be something that's really important and tied into this idea. Um, I mean, I think the good news is with the proliferation of social networks is that readers, followers, whatever you call them, actually humans are back at the center, you know, whereas, you know, maybe five years ago we were writing headlines and, and gearing some of our content for search. We're now actually refocused back on people who need and want and crave media, however that's defined. So I, I don't think that's a trend that's going anywhere, and I think that's actually good news for the media space. And I think we're in the very early days of it. I don't think we've even scratched the surface of what this looks like five years from now, let alone three years from now. So I guess the question, the follow-up I had then for Joe would be, if a media brand is just a kind of an aggregate of the voices that are within it, whether they're professional voices or amateur voices, what is the role of the brand in that sense? I mean, what may I... You I think it's to be the tools within it. I mean, I think that big media companies are still going to be big, big media companies in the future, but I think as you look at it, it's going to be really a mixture of that. I mean, people are much more in the driver's seat than they ever were. It's going to be our job to give you the tools, give you the products, give you the content uh, to maintain our brands and maintain the importance in your life and, and actually in society and media at large. There are certain like, eco um, economies of scale that go into an ABC deal with a Diane Sawyer that doesn't replicate in a, for a startup with right. 10 contributing bloggers. Right. I guess any thoughts on that, on, on that side? Just in terms of, you know, with so much traffic coming from star producers that are, sure, they write for Mashable one day or they write for USA Today one day, they also write for five other places, they have their own blogs, they have their own Twitter streams. How does the media brand sit within that and stay relevant? I think they become a brand as well, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know at that point that you can distinguish between a USA Today, an ABC, a Detroit Free Press, and a Michael Wolf, for instance. Mm -hmm. They build their brands. It's, it, it, I think the distinction would be how many people trust that source, how many people look at that source and say, well, I'm going to quote him, as opposed to, you know, if you, if you look at movie reviews, you know the ones that are pay for play, and you know the ones that, that quote New York Times, Los Angeles Times, ABC, NBC. That's where it ends up mattering. I think it's a two-way street. I think that a brand can further the credibility of an individual, and an individual can further the credibility of a brand. I think we're going to see just equal paths in this way. Yeah, I think you just got to capitalize on the brand lift and, and not fight against it. You know, if you have a star reporter or a star producer, great. You know, embrace it. But I don't think this is new. I, I, you know, yeah. it's a yeah. good question. But I think going back to your point, we're back to you know. There have always been star reporters. There have always been personalities and celebrities and journalists 
who go from one media brand to another or they start their own. Again, it's the same. It's then the technique, the technology, the outlet, the social versus the mobile that is making this different and very nerve wracking for large media companies yeah. because we just don't know the formula anymore. So I think we're pretty much, are we good? So any, I guess while we wrap up, any final thoughts you guys want to share with everybody? Get another one. This Look is at just me. beginning. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we've you can read up Matthew. We've, we've summed it up. In 25 minutes, we knocked yeah. it out. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.